And welcome to the Starshine Podcast. My name is John Penner, and we have with us here today T. Michael Cox. How are you, Michael? I'm very well, thanks, John. It's uh, great to be here, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Yeah, same here. It's like, uh, I think we've shared this interest for a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, just maybe a bit of background with our listeners. What we're, uh, I see you have a lot of books behind you. What is it you've been reading? Um, well, you know, I've, um, uh, at an early age, I got interested in the work of Rudolf Steiner. And uh, I've been studying him since around the mid 80s pretty continuously. And um, I, I feel like I have a reasonable grasp on his way of thinking. And um, I'm hoping that I could share some of that with people today. And uh, I've, I've been interested in this topic of the threefold social organism right from the beginning. So since the mid 80s and throughout my life, I've been observing social phenomena and uh, thinking about social theory and I think I have some things to contribute to the conversation. Very good. Okay, so uh, this idea of social threefolding, in a nutshell, what can you describe it? And how does it differ from communism? How does it differ from communism? Yeah. Well, it's very different from communism. And how does it differ from capitalism? And it's very different from capitalism. All right, so uh, I'll give you a little background. The threefold social organism was uh, a social theory that was put forward by Rudolf Steiner in 1919, which is right after World War I. And at that time, uh, the world had not really experienced such a global catastrophe. And people were asking a lot of questions. How could this have been averted? Uh, how could we have not had this great war? And this was Steiner's answer that the, the war was really a result of uh, our, our thinking about society that is not really any more in step with the, the consciousness of the human being. So he proposed a different way of thinking about society that um, you know, really still needs to be uh, understood today. It hasn't really been grasped because precisely because I think people are caught up in this sort of um, spectrum of left and right or communism and capitalism or traditionalism and progressivism and and it's kind of a instead of this two uh two uh sort of a binary. binary it's a it's a three fold way where there's a more of a check and balance of one thing against two other things that, that kind of reminds me there was a paper by a mathematician some time back and it had uh, period three implies chaos i don't know if you recall it and uh, it was like when you had a sort of a binary back and forth, you always ended up with this tug of, you know, this tug like of war. Tug of war, yeah. And uh, three was the minimum number mathematically where you could get some kind of something interesting happening. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, yeah. why three? Why not four? Why not five, right? And it's like, because it's the least number that you can have to have creativity. And yeah. um, simply the, the formulation, if, uh, if you have a two, uh, two body, like, was it uh, if you have two factors in an equation, if you have three factors in an equation, it implies chaos because you can now have three variables and depending on the state of the other two variables, the, the first variable will take on an entirely different course. And well, it, um, it reminds me a little bit of the three body problem in, in physics that oh, yeah. solving, solving a gravitational um, relationship between two bodies is relatively straightforward. But as soon as yeah. you add a third, that's exactly the, the, the that, number of exactly perturbations it. becomes so complex it it, it actually becomes um, it, it's a non-deterministic uh, computation exactly so to me it was always this um, we're often framed everything today in terms of binaries it's either this or that you know and it's like what about option C you know there, there, there's got to be Another possibility besides just the two that are given us as the as the possibility, and it's like in social threefolding, we there's communism, there's capitalism. What is the third element? Yeah, I I would I would say that it kind of steps outside of that whole paradigm, 
Um, it goes outside of the framework. Yeah, I mean, um, so so one way to think of it perhaps is um, if we if we um, go back to say the French Revolution. Okay. Now okay. during the French in the French Revolution, uh, there were three at one point or at least early on there were three ideals that were put forward by the thinkers of the time. Uh, liberté, égalité, and fraternité, mm, which we yeah, translate yeah. into English as liberty or freedom. Égalité is, means something like fairness. It, it doesn't ex mean equalness, but it means fairness or, or justice. Mm -hmm. And fraternité, is a, it means brother, brotherliness, but let's be less sexist and say something like... Um, well, I wouldn't say community, maybe community, or maybe something like fellowship. Community. I think yeah. community is a good one. And the, yeah. the word in the soccer world is Ubuntu. Ubuntu, yes, that's it, right. It, uh, uh, a uh, fabulous word. distribution, by the way, yeah. Yes, exactly. That's the idea here. And in the French Revolution, um, there was really this idea that at the, at the time, you had to understand that the world had very much been run according to uh, kings and this idea that, or queens, this idea that um, the the head of state was given the right to rule by the divine. This was called the divine right of kings, and so the um, the religious conception was tied to the state, and and the whole I idea was a, a very hierarchical one that. Um, the God and the king would decide the fate of the people. And the French Revolution was an overturning of that hierarchical system and replacing it with this notion of equality that there could be a law that also covers the, the royalty or the kings so that there would effectively be no more divine rule and that there would be a kind of rule of law. Hmm. And and this, this event uh, really changed uh, our society in a way that we can't really imagine today because it's so normalized now. Well, we don't we've really become we, we, like everyone that I know would accept that as a default. Yeah. And like the notion of like having a king or queen saying off with your head would be like, right? It's like, yeah. you know, who would do that? But it's like, we can imagine maybe oh. a time when, you know, the systems that we currently use are replaced with newer updated systems, which, um, you know, as our understanding evolves, that we can uh, adopt better ways of organizing ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And because like, right, like when we talk about social freefolding, it's not just political, it's not just economic, it's about how people work together with other people in a way to formulate our society in a way that is, um, going to be productive and not destructive, right? Because like right now we're, we're getting a lot of war uh, and, and a lot of that has to do with um, hegemony over ancient uh, traditional boundaries. You know, we're, we're seeing the kingdom building right now. Unfortunately, it's horrible. And, um, you know, so like how we organize ourselves as societies uh, has real consequences over the lives of millions of people. The, the systemic uh, bases of how we organize ourselves are, are seldom actually examined. You know, we'll, we accept the two defaults because we're given no alternative. Yeah, so so I was going to say that in or originally there were these three ideals. And then um, this led to what is sometimes referred to in American discourse as the separation of church and state. So the idea that the, um, we'll call it the spiritual cultural life became separated from the state. And this was something new in, 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 well, relatively new. And it became, as you said, very widespread across the earth. Um, today, there are still monarchies. Some of them are more uh, formal than real. Mm. Um, but uh, what, the, what the issue is for me is that there were actually three ideals. And it, it turned out to be the separation of two parts. Um, the church and the state or the religious life and the, the secular life. And this has created this binary issue. But there were actually three ideals and the, the one of them got dropped out kind of 
today we have a lot of discourse, a lot of political discourse around the, the binary of freedom versus equality. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't usually talk too much, at least in the Western world, about fellowship or community as mm -hmm. a political topic. I mean, yeah. we, it's there, but I don't see people waving. I see people shouting freedom and equality, but I don't see people shouting community in the same political mm -hmm. way. And part of this is because um, this, I would, I would argue this revolution, the French revolution isn't, isn't quite finished yet. Hmm. And there's still one more phase to go, which is the separation of state and economy. So right now we live in a world where those two remain intertwined. And- That's interesting. You know, separation yeah. of state of, uh, and economy, like what do you mean by that? Yeah, so if you were to speak to somebody in the 16th century that, and tell them that in the future there would be a separation of church and state, they would think you're crazy. They, to, in, their, in the 16th century mind, the, the divine right and the state were one thing, and to separate them, it just seems impossible. Today, we, we, we think it's normal. To, like, how would you even want to combine them? And at the same time, we say, while well, politics and economy are intertwined, they could never be separated. But I, I think if you understand R Rudolf Steiner's perspective, you could in easily envision a world in the future where the economy, the state, and the spiritual cultural life had become three separate independent things. Hmm. This is the basic idea of social threefolding. I, I would say there is a large feeling that people want to emancipate the economic life from the state. And I'll give you an example of cryptocurrency. People, I think what underlies that desire is to have a monetary system that is not controlled by state actors. Well, yeah, so with cryptocurrency, you have a fiat currency that kind of levels the playing field between actors. They can be countries or they can be corporations or they can even be people, right? And uh, by leveling, and as you say, it, it kind of separates currency from country. Um, yeah. And, and I, I would argue that this is a sign that people, they don't really know how to articulate it. They, this, the cryptocurrency is not really what will never really lead to a threefolding, in my opinion, but it does indicate the direction that that we it's an enabler it's an enabler to that sort of functioning no it's a i i would say it's a it's a manifestation of the will the unconscious will of people hmm. okay to separate the economy from the state but there's probably a much better way to do this than cryptocurrency hmm. uh, just just simply put cryptocurrency has no way of associating uh, a way of like setting interest rates or any kind of um, fiscal or monetary policies. So you need to always rely on a state. It, it can never really be an independent factor. It's always backed by a state. Yeah. And, and it will never actually lead to a true separation. The, that's okay. another topic, but. So um, uh, Michael, could, maybe what you could do is just like, you know, we're, we're used to the politicians, where we're used to the bankers. Could you maybe draw a, a schematic, just a, a quick picture? What would a functioning social threefolding organization look like? Like you have this, uh, you know, the, the finance department, you have the, um, the, uh, the, the rights department, and you have the cultural sphere or the community. What, how, how would you describe this? Okay, so... Um... If I were to paint a picture of what a future world could look like, um, it would be something like this, that um, there would be almost three separate governments, you could think of it. Not, and not exactly, but um, imagine very regional. Agencies. Well, regional um, decision-making, a regional governance that occurs for the sake of individuals, freedom and culture and religious rights and things like that. And then you'd have a larger region 
that might have um, uh, a, a state like we have now with laws and a justice system and law enforcement and military and self and defense systems and so on. And then you would also have a third separate system of economic life where the transactions are occurring independently of governments. So, um, uh, but also in a decentralized way. So th this is the, kind the, of important. The, if you say independently of governments, does that mean unlawful? No, I mean um, uh, independent. Like, so, so if I want to purchase something uh, and have it shipped to me from yeah. another place, that whole transaction occurs in independently of any particular country. Okay. So. Uh, it's kind of we are we are working on developing a global economy, for sure. But but imagine that this global economy is not managed by states, but rather by decentralized communities of or some Steiner called them associations of people working together to manage this in an entirely uh, independent track from the states, from countries. Mm -hmm or nations. Okay. Uh, so like, let, let's maybe describe one transaction through an association. How would that, that work? Um, well, I, I feel like that would be a little bit of a specialized topic. I, I, would, okay. I would prefer at this moment- to Stay at the global scale and don't get the micro right away. Right. Um, yeah, we could, you know, that would be a whole separate podcast, I think, um, to talk about the money system. But I just wanted to, um, I wanted to spend a little time uh, sort of describing the basic idea of threefolding uh, because it, it's, it would give a wrong impression if, if there was some kind of specific picture that, that, was, that Steiner had in mind. It wasn't so much that he said, oh, you need to do this, this, and this. That's not yeah. what he was about. It was, it's not some kind of utopia or um, uh, end result he's describing. It's more of a process. And, and that process relies a lot upon how we think about things. So if, yeah. we, if we think in a binary way, we will end up with a binary society. True. What we need to do is learn to think in a trilateral way, and then we will end up with a, a trilateral society. That's the sort of how do we... How do we think socially? I guess. Yeah. And and perhaps I could I could begin with a with an one example. Um, so let's let's imagine for a moment um, a situation where um, some some fruit like pears are being uh, grown and harvested and sold and consumed. So you have we can imagine um, on one level. You have uh, an orchard and you have trees growing, pear trees, and then people would go and uh, look after these trees. And then when they got ripe, they would pick the pears from the trees, they'd load them on a truck, mm -hmm. transport them to a supermarket, put them out for display. People would come in and buy them, wash them, eat them. And then they would digest the, the, these pears and the, that, that would provide them sustenance for their life. And that kind of process Steiner refers to as the economic life. Hmm. So if we, if we think of that process as occurring, as I described, it has everything to do with the physical products, the consumption, the distribution, and the production of, of material goods. That is the economic life. Now, if we, if we look at the same situation and kind of uh, fade our focus away from that and put our focus instead on another layer of the same reality, we could call it the rights life. We could see that there's another layer of things going on here, such as who is it that owns the orchard? Who has the right? Right. So it's, it's the same activity, but there's two layers yeah. of interpretation. Exactly. So, the, so just thinking about the same situation from the perspective of the rights life, mm -hmm. instead of the economic life, we could see this idea of ownership rights. We could see the idea of profit sharing. Who, who has the right to what 
uh, part of the profits. This might depend on a company. And, and how, how many hours are you supposed to be working? Are you supposed to be doing 12 hour days yeah. or two hour days? Like, Yeah, for example, how are people being compensated for labor? Are they paid salary or wage? Are they, what about licensing? Um, you can't really drive a truck on a public road without a driver's license. So you need to have services. For example, at the grocery store, a third party transaction service you know, that swipes your card, that's a service provider for this operation. Um, you have things like taxes. Uh, a portion of the profits goes to the benefit of society as a whole. You have labor and safety laws, law enforcement, justice system, and a whole layer of rights that lays on top of the exact same situation from the perspective of, um, you know, what's going on. Right and then the there's a third layer, okay? Mm -hmm. So the first layer is the economic life, the second layer is the rights life, mm -hmm. and the third layer is what Steiner calls the spiritual cultural life. Uh -huh. And this, is, this he describes as everything that has to do with human individuality. So for example, one person might be physically taller or more fit or more intelligent or otherwise more capable of picking fruit than another person or or of driving the truck than another person one person might be more skilled but, at selling so there, there's aptitudes you just be aptitudes. some people have aptitudes in this or that field yeah and also another a person might be clever and and come up with an idea for a, a pole that they could use to pick uh, pears off the tree so it would save it would save time another person might have um Invention available investment capital, and they could use it to to purchase a truck or a forklift to make the labor more effective. So these are the elements that have to do with the individual life. And a lot of these are, uh, Timothy. If I'm not mistaken, a lot of these things I, are like uh, unique cultural contributions, like music and software. Well, I'm I'm talking specifically of the example of picking pears. Sorry, that that, that, yeah, that really I mean, deviates from picking pears, but like yeah. uh, in, in in general sense, the cultural are like the mental or um, contributions. Like music comes out of your mind and your yeah. heart, of course, and uh, you know software comes out of is a product of the mind. It comes out of seemingly nowhere, but it comes out of the product of human human imagination, and it's uh, these sorts of um, and somewhat intangible but real um aspects is it yeah i i, I just picked one example i chose the example of pairs uh, sorry so you could take, I, I i didn't mean take, to deviate from that, that that was a really good example and i uh, yeah. i shifted off i was, I was just gonna go on to say that we could we could pick any example from our social life um like you said uh, uh, uh a person composing music would be an example and you could talk about the economic layer to that there would be all the all the sort of physical material elements that go up into making that happen, the chair you're sitting on, the the electricity that's supplying your your system, and how that is is paid for, and then you have a rights life, maybe mm -hmm. copyrights, ownership rights over the I, intellectual property, mm -hmm. um, licensing, all the safety compensation issues taxes, all of that belongs to the rights life. And then there's the spiritual cultural life, which probably is the main thing in this, in the example of composing music, which has to do with a person's capacity to do that, the appreciation of others of that capacity, the ability of a person to portray or, or manifest their skill in the form of music and so on and so on. You know, uh, there might be you might also talk about the ability of a sound mixer or the ability of a, a marketing person to, to make that um, possible and make mm. it financially viable. It, it doesn't even have to be financially viable. You could just be doing it for yourself. Um, it doesn't have to be about money, obviously. Mm. But um, I'm just saying there are all these different sort of, you, it, it's almost like mental focusing. You can focus on the economic life Mm -hmm. You can focus on the rights life, or you can focus on the spiritual cultural life of any given situation. I see. So the, these are levels that we can interpret a given situation. And uh, there, there's a political aspect, there's an economic aspect, and there's a cultural aspect. 
Well, I would call it economic rights and spiritual cultural. Okay. Uh, the, uh, I, I was being political. political to the to the rights because if your politicians are doing the job, they'll represent the people. Yeah, but it could even just be like, um, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? It isn't necessarily political. Right. It's just about um, uh, agreeing about who has the right to do what and who who has the responsibility to do what. Okay. Right. It doesn't necessarily involve the state. Right. I'm using that two ways. Uh, correct. Yeah. So, and then, and then another example might be a, a traffic stop by a police officer. Again, yeah. you could look at it from all these different perspectives, but maybe on that particular instance, the, the main emphasis is on rights. So, and the other two are less important. So depending on the situation, there might be a relative emphasis of one over the other, but they're all three happening simultaneously. So you could say that social threefolding is a is a way of looking at things instead of in a binary way, in in this uh, layering to, um, of three different types uh, of the of the social of the rights and of the economic um, in a given situation. Right. So so I I'm kind of expressing the point of view that the first step to emancipating these three from each other is to think of them as separate. And so if we can first learn to just think of them in as different layers of independent layers, then eventually, if people think like this, we will start to see ways of making it more uh, separate in reality. You no, know, I had thought of talking about things like how, how Steiner's thinking challenges our commonly held concepts. Um, and how, how, you know, I, like things like um, Steiner does not include services in the economic life. He doesn't, he doesn't oh, include um, there's labor. A there's a, uh, a place where he talks about um, you can't actually uh, charge, you can't actually pay someone by the hour. You can exactly. only pay them for their attention or, or something to that effect. You're, yeah, his, his notion of labor. Okay, what is Steiner's notion of labor? Um, all right, so Steiner has a kind of unusual way of thinking about labor, or unusual in the sense that it is not the way we normally think about it. Um, for instance, he does not consider uh, services to be part of the economic life. Uh, the economic life, in his view, is everything that has to do with the production, distribution, and consumption of commodities. So okay. for example, yeah. if you work in a, if you cut hair or you're a, like a barber or a hairdresser, you do not actually work in the economic life. You, what you're doing is a service. Um, you're not, unless you're cutting hair for the purpose of selling it, like um, a sheep shearer. Okay, so like he, he's talking about, uh, so he's saying economic life is things, not verbs, nouns, not verbs. Right. And, and so, so when, when, we, um, provide, when someone provides a service, that's actually part of the spiritual cultural life. Because they're an action. The economic it, it, life. Because they're an action and not a thing. Um, because this is something that people are doing out of their own individual capability. I see. Uh, anyone can pick a pair, and it doesn't matter who picks the pair when you see it on the shelf at the store, but it does matter a great deal who is cutting your hair and their skill. In fact, that's the main thing that you, you pay for when you're getting a haircut. I, you know, not that I get haircuts often, but <laughs> um, that is something that um, yeah. is an example of something that, that is not part of, it's, he, Steiner considers that part of the, um, he calls it spiritual labor, not physical labor. Yeah. And he distinguishes the two. Hmm. Okay. So well, that's, that, 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 that's interesting because like, I, yeah. I, I wouldn't have uh, like coming, coming from it cold, I wouldn't have known the, the difference right. Right? because that's not, most people don't separate uh, the commodity from the action. Uh, right. they, people, people tend to roll everything into the economic life. And so the word economics that Steiner uses overloaded. means something slightly different 
than economics as it, as it is commonly used. Yeah. And so if you read Steiner with, with, with a different concept of e economic, you will, you will read into him something he's not actually saying. Always so a that's a point yeah. to be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, another, another example is um, his idea of, of payment for, uh, for labor. Steiner, Steiner argues quite successfully, I believe, that it is not possible, not possible, no matter what you think you're doing, to pay somebody for their labor. Okay. So, so, for example, he, he gives the example um, let's say somebody's driving the truck full of pears towards the supermarket and they get T boned by somebody else in the, at, the, at an intersection. Okay. Yeah. So the person or their insurance company will be liable for the inflicting of that pain, the loss of livelihood, the loss of inventory, and all the harm that is caused by that accident. So that is actually a legal rights issue, correct? Right, okay. Now consider on the, at the same time, the person who is helping to unload the truck or drive the truck or, or anything to do with the economic production of value in the economic life, they are, are actually doing the exact opposite. They are contributing to your success. Right. And, and so, so they, so one they is have an entitlement. One is incidental. They have an entitlement to, to the profits in the same way that the person who causes the accident is liable for the loss. Okay. So, so you, when you pay somebody for labor, you're not paying them for hours of work or or anything like that you're paying, you're paying them, them for, for their result. contribution with to which they are entitled oh, i see and it's a it's a rights issue uh in in steiner's in steiner from steiner's perspective labor is never a commodity when i buy the pair i do not buy labor right as part of that right the the labor is like an activity that surrounds. Yeah, it, 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 it it's all there. it's all integrated into value. However, is it not? Yes, it's costed into the price, but that price is then returned to compensate for the benefit provided by the labor provider. Okay, but it is it cannot it can never be purchased. You cannot buy labor. Okay, that, well that, that's an interesting product. distinction because it's like you know go, going forward into. The, so we, we have the commodities, we have the labor, um, and how is it that, that the associations work in um, negotiating um, the values here? Well, I, I, I just want to be clear that on the outside, it may look like we are paying for labor, like we are paying for a commodity. It's just a technical distinction, really that we're, we're not actually doing that. That's not actually what's happening. I see. Uh, another example might be um, if you buy a property like a piece of real estate, you do not buy the property. You merely buy the right to use the property. So, so when I buy a pear, I can eat it and I can consume it and it's gone. Yeah. I cannot do that with a piece of land. The land will outlast us. That's right. I can, only, <laughs> I can only pay a certain amount of money to purchase the right to use the land. Okay. So, and that, so that's, uh, that's land uh, is not a commodity. by the divine right of kings at some point, I think. Right. Well, the army is involved. Land is usually first acquired by conquest. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like and, and if, if we live in a country, it's by some divine right. The right of use is usually enforced by um, violence, yeah, or yeah. law enforcement or something. So, but but the point is that there are certain things that are not that we think of as part of the economic life, which actually are not. They're part of the rights life. That, that's interesting. So you can kind of separate them a bit that way. Mm -hmm. And so we, our our thinking is actually very confused about society according to this way of thinking that. If we were to just clarify our own thinking processes, we would start to understand relationships and social systems more uh, accurately. 
Um, I'll give you another example. Um, on another wavelength, um, Steiner believed that education and healthcare are necessarily always under the heading of the free spiritual cultural life. I see. So um, we could say, for instance, education is a right. Um, every child has the right of education. But in fact, the content of this education should never be, according to Steiner, the, the determined by a state. Or else it becomes propaganda. Well, yeah. I mean, the, if you look in the history of the, the main proponents of, of state-based education, it was, it was people like Karl Marx. Yeah. Or... Um, Indoctrinate the us. Basically want to <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and, and who want um, a certain worldview put out into the population. Mm -hmm. And my perspective is, um, like, for example, today we have a lot of people who advocate for a scientific education and against mm -hmm. a religious education. Um, my personal opinion is that uh, well-educated uh, the uh, theolo theologians are not the world's biggest problem. The world's biggest problem has more to do with ignorance yeah. and the fact that people reject education entirely because they may or may possibly don't agree with the underlying worldview, or even if they agree with it, they don't agree with the way that it's being imposed. So, so maybe, so, maybe this is like, a, you know, children sense they're being um, propagandized and they re inner, inwardly rebel because they're right. intelligent and they want to have a broader education about like, how does the world actually work? What, so they spend 12 the years factors? rebelling. Yeah, they spend 12 years of their school life rebelling yeah. and not yeah. learning anything because they don't want, they don't like the method and they end up They're like, uh, what, what, we better. don't need no education. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, right? The Pink Floyd song. Yeah. Wouldn't it be better if uh, people had an education, even if it was a religious education, which, you know, is dubious, but at least they have an education that they can accept and that they can work with. And then when they get older, if it is true, as many scientific proponents believe that science is better than religion, if that is, if that is true, then people will figure that out when they get older. Um, if it's not true, then they'll, they won't figure that out. So uh, uh, of course, we, of course we wanna... what are you so afraid of? Yeah. If, if, you, if you believe that a scientific education is, is closer to truth than a religious one, then don't be so afraid of allowing people to have any a more open education format and letting people find the truth on their own. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it, you know, it, it could be said here that uh, maybe the purpose of education is to, you know, not to deliver falsehoods, but to, but to, you know, you know, get kids connected with this truth in the first place. Um, you know, if you're like, in my opinion, if you're going to have a real education, it's going to teach you some basics about how the world works. Like, you know, you want to know about math, you want to be able to know, you know, um, some basic functioning, like you need to know how to read, uh, you know, you, you want to be introduced to the uh, context of uh, the history of world literature, not just uh, for your own particular genre, but like for what was really going on in history, which helped, you know, bring us here. Um, there's a lot you might want to know, you know, growing up before you hit the, the adult world, you know. Um, and not just be under a doctrine of like, um, you know, the, like, you know, you could be under, you know, a secular state school and you're going to be taught this and you're going to be, you know, Karl Marx says you're going to read this, uh, or you can be under, um, uh, let's say you were under a private capitalist school and you would be indoctrinated with uh, just, you know, these are the capitalist values that you must adhere to, uh, or you could be under uh, like a a religious school and you're taught this how you know like i know that uh, steiner also in addition to the economics he had the uh waldorf schools um and i, I don't really, really want to make this a waldorf topic but uh like you, you did mention education was one of the arms here of the social threefolding how does that relate in like a, how does a waldorf school function differently say um than a public school 
uh, not just in the context of North America, where they generally operate as private schools because of the economic setup of the United States, but in other countries as well as an independent agency. Um, so on that topic, I, I would just make a distinction um, between three different types of schools. Um, what's confusing is how they're named. Um, so, so I'm going to use the word private. A, a private school or a school that is conceptually private is one where it's privately funded, it's closed to the public, and you have private tutors. I, I used to work as a math tutor, for instance, as a private tutor. I would go to uh, a family's house, sit at their kitchen table, and work with the young person on math. This was not open to the public. You would have to engage me. That's private. Private then tutor. We have, okay. we have a concept of state education, mm -hmm. which in Canada we call public, but it is, not, it is actually a state education. Mm -hmm where it's open to all children and it's funded through state taxes. Then there's a kind of education which is conceptually public, which is different, which means all children may attend, but it's funded by the families. So mm -hmm. for example, um, Walmart is a public company. Anyone can walk into Walmart and buy stuff, and, but you pay for it as you use it. That's the concept of public. Public is not the same as state. State is where the state pays through taxes. Uh -huh. So, so it, it's confusing because sometimes public schools are state schools and state schools are maybe public schools that, like state colleges in, in the United States are really public uh, schools, not really state schools because they're not funded by the states mm -hmm. and so on. But, Conceptually, there's a private, a state, and a public. I see. Concept. Okay. So Steiner would say that that in this conceptual manner, Waldorf or all education should not be state education, if possible, but public education. So uh, that's interesting. So it's state. It's not state, but it is public. So so my my belief, however, now maybe I I've, I've said too much. I I, put in, I don't want to put words in Steiner's mouth. Um, he only argued, I should say, that education belongs to the free spiritual cultural life, mm -hmm. that the state should not um, dictate any kind of curriculum content for schools, for education. And that's why so, it doesn't become propaganda. Absolutely. Um, I believe, I believe in, in the a voucher system. So we have a problem that we want to reconcile this idea that children have the right of education. We want to reconcile the idea that children need to be educated and they need to be funded so that the, bulk, the, the payment, the cost of education is not born inequitably. But at the same time, we want to have this freedom principle of having choice. And so the voucher system, voucher is a concept. Um, I'm not really sure where it first started. Uh, you know, decades ago, where uh, you, you would essentially pay taxes towards education, and then these, the taxes would be used to meet out back according to the children you have. So if you have three children, you'd get three vouchers for your children, your children ed the education of your children. Mm -hmm. If you have no children, you would get no vouchers, but you would probably still pay an equal amount of state tax towards education. Mm -hmm. And that way, it ensures the right of education and the equity. But then you could take your voucher to any school and say, I, want, I would so like the, to enroll my so child. The, 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 in a way that uh, this drives towards um, the, the merit of the, the school, you know, the, the school has got to get a good reputation at doing a good job in order to get people to use their vouchers at their, at their establishment. Right. Um, and also, and also the school can say, no, uh, we, do, we do not accept that way. child at it's our school. Yeah. I see. It's got to be two ways. So it's the a... child has to, has to sort of be uh, acceptable in some way, shape, or form, either yeah. so sport it, or it, intellectually or in some other way, behaviorally. It's got to be met, it's gotta be met 
met uh, on both ends. Right. And, and the concept here is that, um, you know, going back to these three uh, ideals that were articulated during the French Revolution of freedom, fairness, and fellowship, education really embodies this freedom characteristic. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the spiritual cultural life generally is ruled by this ideal of freedom. Um, it's very important that people develop their own individual differences in a free manner. Um, you and I, John, we are different in many ways. We are similar in many ways, but we are individuals. And if we are in, a, in an educational environment where too much similarity is required of us, then I don't get to become me and you don't get to become you. Mm. And so what's really important for the unfolding of the, the free spiritual cultural life is that education provide a basis for the flourishing of the individuality. Some people mm. are good at sports. Some people are good at this or that. And, and that's what education needs to do is to help people become the best they can be. That's 100% true. Right. Uh, so true. So that's the one ideal. The, the ideal of the rights life is fairness. So Steiner, you could say, was an advocate of a small state, hmm. something in common with um, certain right-wingers that uh, they want to have as little influence over the society, over the economic life and over the cultural life as possible, that the state's job really is just to mediate the, the, the polarity of individual and community. Just enough to optimize between those two processes. Right. So, for example, consider um, an intersection, a traffic intersection. Um, if there was no traffic lights or no stop signs or no other regulation, there would be people that are, we'll call them freedom lovers, who just want to aggressively drive through very, you know, as fast <laughs> as they can because they have freedom and they want to do it. And then there are other people that are more tending towards the community and they'll say, no, please go first, please go first. And, and they'll end up stopping and creating a huge traffic jam behind them. And it will create chaos. <laughs> so Have you ever seen those? The um... state is, to, is to put in a traffic light to manage, to sort of tamper down the freedom a little bit. It optimizes. The allow process. things to flow uh, properly. And it, that's it, it really the only the role the state has in Steiner's view. I see. So he believed in a small state. Um, so it, that it, he had in common with the capitalists. The, 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 it's, it's interesting because like, it, it looked a little bit like Karl Marx with like Das Kapital with the beard. And it's, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's well, well, the, the, the word you know, from Steiner, the- Steiner was certainly not a Marxist. Um, he, he did, however, believe that the community should be able to put checks and balances on individual liberties. Right. So, uh, so in our modern context, for instance, we have, we have people that um, uh, engage in, in commercial activities that have what's, what are called externalities, uh, pollution. So if, if I'm producing something and I don't have to pay for my own pollution, I can sell the product and actually effectively make a profit off other people's pollution. That, yes, because that's... That um... I would argue Steiner was opposed to because this gives too much power to the individual. There needs to be a way for the community to, um, um, to bring those factors into the price. Yeah, it's like if you're gonna like shoot the whole lake with your waste, uh, tail waste, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, that impacts the entire community. So in that, in that sense, he was a bit of a communist not really, but he, he, would, he would argue against uh, liberal capitalism or unbridled capitalism. Yeah, so well, he, it, it's, it's interesting because like he, he would be too... Um, uh, he's too uh, left I, I get, for the right wing. Or he, he, he would right be too left for the right wing and too right uh, for the left wing, right? Like, which is maybe a, an indication that you're pulling a middle path, which is right. what which I see as the desirable one. Yes. Um, you know, it's it's in the synthesis, not in the extremes, uh, that we find balance. 
Um, yeah. So ah. if you look, if you look in chapter two of Steiner's book, I'll hold it up for this for the audience. Um, it's it towards social renewal is my translation. There are other translations of this same book. Um, in chapter two, Steiner describes uh, an, a sort of metaphor between the social, the three aspects, the economic life, the rights life, and the spiritual cultural life, and compares them with the human organism in, by comparing them to the economic life is similar to the nervous system or the head. The, the rights life- Oh, really? I thought the, the economic was the hands because it was the capital of the, and the doing. No, 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 no. Oh. I, I think that's a big misconception I've encountered upon, among people um, who are interested in the threefold social organism that they, they often don't seem to read Steiner. <laughs> like, look it up, John. Uh, I'm not trying to be uh, dismissive yeah, here, no, but I'm just that. saying it, it's, a, it's a common misconception, but let me try to explain it. Um, so Steiner says the, the, the 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 head and the nervous system is analogous to the economic life okay. the the heart lung circulatory and rhythmic system is analogous to the state mm -hmm. and the limbs and metabolic system our energetic system as it were is analogous to the spiritual cultural life so to find a kind of understanding of this is really challenging because as you kind of uh, indicated inverted, it's easy to flip it around yeah mm, yeah no and, and and get it confused and 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 i think this is one of the tasks that we are called upon is to really think it correctly so yeah to disentangle says, this. sorry to disentangle this yeah disentangle so um one of the things he's he talks about when you when you consider the nervous system the nervous system is is actually a kind of almost dead part of us um the you know in contrast to the rest of like our fleshy parts if you were to cut yourself it kind of heals back heals quickly but that's not true of the nerves um i you know you know this as a fact because you've had some nerve damage in your life and it doesn't heal in the same way that um that uh the limbs do for instance the the metabolic system or the fleshy parts Mm -hmm. um the 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 nervous system he says is the most independent part of us it's almost like it is non not living it's almost like a corpse within us we could say so our nervous system is the most materialized densified and least active part of us mm -hmm. in fact our sense apparatus works because it is receptive if, if our senses were um, active, like our muscles, we would never be able to see anything. It's, it's the receptivity, the lack of activity that allows us to have sensation. Mm. And this is analogous to the economic life, which is all about the material life. If, if we didn't have a body, we wouldn't need an economic life. The chair you sit on require is because you have to park your body somewhere the headphones you bought is because you have ears um if you don't if you don't have a physical body we actually don't need an economic life at all mm -hmm. and so so it is really the physicalized part of us that gives rise to the economic life at all now our soul life the fact that we have a psyche uh we have feelings and emotions, desires, thoughts. This life is what gives rise to the need for rights. If you had no emotions, if you were a robot, John, you wouldn't need rights because you wouldn't care. And, and it's really because of our life of emotions, which is uh, analogous to the, the rhythmic, the pulsing, living part of us that pulses through our body, through our circulatory system that gives rise to the fact of the rights life hmm. in society and finally the limbs the limbs are what make us do things the limbs are really what makes us different 
what, what makes us different as individuals is not so much what we think, but what we do. And our actions and our activities, our movement, our being in the world and being active in the world is the world, the life of the spiritual cultural. And it is, arises from the fact that we have a spirit. <clears throat> so the economic life arises from the fact we have a body, the rights life from the fact we have a soul or a psyche. And because we have a human spirit, because we have a capacity of individual agency, therefore we also need to have a spiritual cultural life. Hmm. And so it's really the limbs that manifest that spirit in us, in the human being. Okay, that's, that's good. So the three, um, so just maybe to summarize, the, the three aspects of the social life are the economic, um, the rights, and the spiritual cultural. And uh, the economic life is the social or the fraternity uh, that has to do with production, distribution, and consumption of commodities. And the rights life is the social ideals and the fairness, the public law uh, of rights and human labor. And then uh, the spiritual cultural life has to do with the idea of liberty and freedom, and it arises through individuality. And also things like education, media, religion, cultural expression, healthcare, these are all aspects of the free cultural life, hmm. spiritual cultural life. Software as well, I imagine. Yes, I, I would say all kinds of services, uh, software, like hardware, this is the distinction. Hardware is, is an economic thing. You need to transport it. You need to manufacture it. Whereas software, it really comes out of the human mind. And, and it is right. a, it's, it's, it's almost analogous to writing or poetry or literature. Yeah, it's a pro is it, uh, software is a product of the human mind. Right. The only difference is that it does something. Um, it, it can. It well, can we've hooked it up to do activate something. Activate a servo or something, right? Yeah. yeah. Activate. So, yeah. so that's what makes software um, more powerful on, an, on a material plane than, say, poetry or literature. Well, it, uh, software moves machines and poetry moves human souls. Let's there put it go. that way. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me see here. What's next on the list? We have challenges. Well, I think we've covered more or less what I was thinking of as an introduction. I, I think there's more that can be said in terms of um, money. We haven't really talked about, um, you know, I'm, I, we could talk about current events. I'm, that tends to be kind of controversial. I, I would rather leave it in a more theoretical the, the, way. Yeah, no, there, there's, um, I think there's enough ideas to cover here yeah. without getting into- Yeah, people stuff. can apply it to current events as they wish. Yeah, no, I, I think, first of all, we, we just wanna get the, the ideas and the principles of social threefolding and how it's applied is, um, you know, another can of worms. Yeah. So. Uh, okay. So um, I'm at uh, maybe uh, I'm gonna uh, call a close to this. Okay. And uh, I'm gonna end it with um, I shouldn't have interrupted before, uh, but there's a, there's a good quote by Rudyard Kipling, and I'm gonna read it here. And this is the law of the wild, and as old as true as the sky, the wolf who keeps it will prosper and the wolf who breaks it will die. Like the wind that circles the tree trunk, this run, law runneth forward and back. The strength of the pack is the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is the pack. And this is, uh, you know, integrates the contradiction of social and individuality uh, in, in, a, in a very nice image. Yeah. Um, there we go. Um, okay, Michael, thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thanks um, for having me, John. I hope we see you again uh, for, for some future uh, Starshine podcasts. Yeah. Uh, we really appreciate your insights, and, um, and uh, we hope to have, have you back soon. Yeah, I, I'm glad to be part of the conversation, John.
my hair on fire. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Michael.